Good, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, actually third talk in our uh, most recent series on uh, health and well-being. Thank you so much, as always, for uh, joining us. Um, by now, our guest speaker, Mrs. Um, Debbie Gross, is uh, familiar to all of us. This is the uh, third Sunday in a row um, that you've joined us. So, uh, firstly and most importantly, thank you so much for giving so Thanks. generously of your uh, of your time. And I am conscious that. Uh, as I've said in the last sessions, whilst this is a very convenient time for us, um, this is, is late in Israel and uh, we really appreciate uh, you giving of your time uh, in order to help and uh, support and educate our community. Um, I'm not going to introduce Mrs. Gross for too long because, as I've said, we, uh, we by now uh, know her already. Um, she's a psychologist and a social worker by trade and a, a winner of a number of awards, um, awards for uh, her life really spent dedicated in caring and advocating and supporting victims of abuse. Um, been a leader in uh, for more than 30 years in uh, crisis intervention in Israel and uh, throughout the globe and uh, we really enjoyed and benefited from your previous sessions and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you uh, this evening on in this talk entitled helping friends and family who are struggling. Um, I'd also like to welcome another familiar face, um, member of our community, Mrs uh, Caroline Cohen, who will uh, also be presenting this evening during the second part of the evening. Um, Caroline is the principal social worker for Chama, who uh, works with couples and individuals um, of different walks of life, different ages, with diverse experiences, needing emotional and uh, practical support on their fertility journey. And she's been working as a uh, psychotherapist and social worker for some 30 years, um, with particular training, specialist training in trauma, anxiety, depression, and uh, loss. And therefore, really thank you to uh, both of you for joining us this evening. And also want to thank uh, my rabbits and my wife um, who arranged these evenings and uh, has made the connection uh, in order to allow us to be here and hopefully to learn a lot together. Um, the format of the evening will be that Mrs. Gross, Debbie Gross, will be speaking for some 40 minutes, after which um, Caroline will speak briefly and uh, take some of the, uh, the ideas that have been shared and uh, put them in the context of uh, local experiences and share with us um, a range and wealth of um, communal and local resources and access to support, which is available here in uh, Northwest London and beyond. And hopefully we'll also have time after that for uh, questions and uh, comments so that this can be a little bit more of a uh, discussion. I'm going to follow the normal feedback if, uh, format and I'm going to mute uh, everyone using the, uh, the power of uh, host. And um, please though, do use the chat function to post questions. Um, you can do so to uh, everyone on the chat or you can do so individually to me and I will uh, moderate the questions and try and share them with our speakers. Um, please don't just post them to our guest speakers because they've asked, sometimes it's hard for uh, them when they're speaking to be able to check that they're keeping up to date with the chat. So if you want your questions to have the best chance of being asked, um, please do, do post it to me and I will do my best to make sure that our speakers um, are asked all the questions that are posted. Um, so without further ado, um, thank you very much again, Mrs. Debbie Gross, and I'm now going to hand over to you um, to take us forward, after which uh, we'll hear from Mrs. Caroline Cohen. Thank you. Okay, so good evening to everybody. It's good to see you. And we spoke last time about trauma. We talk, spoke about crisis. And today we're going to try to focus, if we recognize someone, who seems to be in some sort of crisis situation, how do we reach out to them? What can we do? How can we reach out in the right way? Now, all of us know that um, if we walk in the street and someone says to us, how are you? We usually say, fine, whether we're feeling fine or not. It's instinctual. So we at Tehel have developed a system. It's a five-point system called Just Ask. And we're going to go through those five points. And those five points really give us direction how we can reach out to friends or family members who are going through a tough time. Afterwards, we're going to talk about post-traumatic growth and how maybe we or our friends or our family can actually find a way to grow from this traumatic situation or from this crisis. So we talk about the Just Ask system. It has five points. Plan ask, listen, encourage, reconnect. And you can remember the five points because the first letter of each reach, um, becomes PAL-ER. 
be a friend in an emergency. And we're going to go through each of those five steps. The five steps for just ask are plan, ask, listen, encourage, reconnect, PAL ER. Now, when do we use this? Now, do you ever have a feeling that someone you know or care about is having a difficult time? Maybe their behavior isn't typical. They seem agitated. They seem withdrawn. They're just not themselves. The first thing is trust your instinct and then act on it. In other words, if something doesn't feel right, go back to this, to the Just Ask system, follow the five steps, trust your instinct. By starting a conversation or commenting on the changes that you see, you could actually be the one person who could help that person in need. Now they did a study in Australia the year before Corona, and they found that 51% of the people in this large survey said that they had wished that someone would have asked them if they were okay. 51% of the survey. 34% of the females and 24% of the males in this survey said that over that year, they had many times where they had five nights in a row where they couldn't sleep because things were so difficult. So if we have a feeling that a friend or a family member isn't doing well, this system can work. Now, actually, what the Just Ask system does, it empowers the individual and the community to connect and to support those who are dealing with difficulties. The idea is that you don't have to be a social worker. You don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to be a doctor to reach out. People are in isolation, people lonely, people are feeling rejected, and these are very powerful feelings. And each one of us, each one of you, can have the skills to reach out and maybe that real helping hand. Now, we know that there's a history of helplines and hotlines and support groups and um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Samarians. And these are all initiatives of regular people reaching out. And that's what this Just Ask system is about as well. The goal is to identify, understand, and respond. So let's begin. The first step in the Just Ask is plan. P, plan. Now, if it's time to reach out, if you notice change, the first thing you do is step number one, which is plan. Now look, at obviously, if you're sitting on a bus and you see a friend in crisis, you might reach out then. But usually, if we want this to work, we have to do the first step. And the first step is crucial. The first step really enables us to know how to reach out. So first of all, what we're going to do is take a pen and paper or a computer or an iPad or a cell phone, and we're going to write down. What are we going to write down? Well, first of all, what are you seeing? What are you seeing in their behavior? What are you seeing that is giving you that feeling that something isn't right? Are you seeing confusion, irrational behavior, moodiness, concerns about the future? Write it down. Are there concerns that they have too many burdens? Are you seeing loneliness, low self-esteem? Do they seem to feel trapped? Do they seem in pain? Are you seeing anxiety, hopelessness, helplessness? Do they seem like another person? They just don't seem like themselves. Are you seeing anger? Are you seeing sadness? Any of these things, the first step is to write it down and note it in the, any way that's the right way for you. And then we're going to go to the next step in the plan. And we're going to write down what are we seeing in their actions? Are we seeing mood swings? Are we seeing that they're withdrawing from the community or from their family or from their job? Are we seeing a change in their online behavior? 
They used to be on Facebook and Instagram, and now weeks they haven't been on. They used to answer every WhatsApp or every email, and now days go by where they don't even answer at all. Do they seem to be losing an interest in the things that they enjoy? Are you seeing that they can't concentrate? Are you noticing less hygiene? They're not showering. They're not taking care of themselves. She used to always get a manicure every week, and now it's been months. Do they seem less concerned about their appearance? Are we seeing reckless behavior? A change in sleep patterns? Are we seeing drug or alcohol use? or an increase in alcohol use? Are we seeing anxiety? So in the first step in the plan, we're going to notice the changes. We're going to look for these things that we just talked about, and we're going to write down, what do we see? And this is crucial. The next thing is we're going to note, are there any events in their life in the past six months or a year, have there been events in their life that could be crucial and could indicate they're struggling? Have they had relationship issues? Maybe they're in the middle of a divorce. Maybe they had a breakup with a boyfriend. Are they having health issues? Do they have work pressure? Or maybe they were put on leave. Or maybe they were fired. Are they having financial stress? And certainly under the COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of that. Are they under constant stress? Did they lose someone they care about? Or did they lose something they care about? And we're going to think back over these past months. Have there been any events in that person's life that I should note down? before I go talk to them. Now, the next step in the planning is about me. Okay, I wrote down about them, and now I have to check myself. Before you ask, you have to check with yourself and your own life. Are you in a good place now in your life so that you can reach out? Are you generally willing to listen and put time into this? Do you have time and energy now? If you're marrying off your daughter in two days, I'm not sure this is the right time to reach out. And I say that seriously, because when we get to step four and five, you're going to see this is a real undertaking. Do you want to reach out? Are you yourself overburdened? Are you going through a crisis? Are you the right person to have this talk with them? So we're going to check what we see in them. And then we're going to check ourselves and make sure this is the right time for me to do this. And then the next step, it was going to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves emotionally for this conversation. Because if we go and we're not prepared emotionally, and then we react defensively or offensively because of what they say, well, we've done more damage than good. So how do I prepare myself? Do you understand you could be rejected? Do you understand that maybe they don't want help? Do you understand that you can't fix and you can't solve their problem? And that is crucial. You know, if we go into helping with the idea that we're going to solve the person's problem, we're really going to fail. We can't solve their problem but we can be there to help them. And that is a crucial difference. Do you understand that you can't fix them? 
Do you understand that they may not want to talk? They may not want to open up. Or do you understand that they may not want to talk to you? And I have to prepare myself for this. Because what's the sense of going out to help? Then I'm going to feel rejected. And then they're going to feel guilty that I feel rejected. And then they're going to feel worse than they felt. So I am preparing myself that it could be they won't talk. That it could be they'll say no. That it could be they'll reject me. And once I've prepared myself, I have the final part of the plan. Choose the moment. Where should this conversation take place? I'm not going to open up this conversation in the middle of the kitchen when everyone's standing around. But think one minute. Think one minute in our impulsivity. How often do we do that? Our daughter comes into the kitchen and she looks so depressed and it hurts our heart and we right away start talking. Do I honestly think she's going to open up to me in this situation? Where should I have this talk? I have to allow for privacy. It has to be in a place where we can have a one-to-one -one private talk. It has to be a place that I can talk to her and she can feel safe. And then I have to figure out when. What time, what time of day, what hour is right to have this talk and allow enough time? I'm not going to start the talk 10 minutes before I have to get out of the house and get off to work. What time, where, and allow enough time. And I'm going to do all of this homework because if I want to succeed in helping someone, I can't be impulsive. So the first step is P for plan. The second step is ask. And how are we going to do that? Well, you're going to take that list you made, and there's a reason for the list. That list is going to show that you noticed. That list is going to show that you care. That list is going to show your empathy. And what you're going to do is tell them, I've noticed lately that you're not on WhatsApp and you're not on Facebook. I noticed that you haven't been going to work. You seem exhausted. You seem so tired. I'm going to tell that person what I've noticed. What are my concerns? And then I'm going to say, are you okay? Three magical words. Are you okay? And because I've already done the background and they see that I've really looked at them, I've really been concerned about them, I've really thought this out. And then when I say, are you okay? There's a much bigger chance that they'll answer me. It's very different than I see someone in the street and I say, how are you doing? Are you okay? I'm showing them that I care. I'm showing them that I want to help. I'm showing them that they can talk to me. So I reflect back to them the things that I have noticed. I know that you got laid off from your job. And I'm sure there must be real financial stress now. I also know that one of your children is quite sick over the past few weeks. And you look exhausted. Are you okay? And the final part to the ask step is to respect their privacy and respect their confidentiality. If they opened up to me, they opened up only to me. Now, we all know if we're talking about a teenager or someone under the age of 18, I can't promise confidentiality. So let's start right there first. Before 
I talk to anyone under 18. I have to remember that it could be they will tell me something that I might have to report. So if they ask me, do you promise not to tell anyone? I can't give that promise. So many times teenagers would say to me, you know, Debbie, I finally trusted an adult. I finally found someone I could trust, and she betrayed my trust also. She promised me she wouldn't tell anyone. So under 18, we can't make that promise. Often what I will say is everything you tell me will stay between us unless it's a case that I might have to report, but I'll try to tell you beforehand. And then if she doesn't tell me, she doesn't tell me. But I don't betray her trust. But someone over 18, I have to respect their privacy and their confidentiality, which means I can't tell it to other people. And I have to really think, how am I going to help them in that situation? So we've talked about plan, and we've talked about ask. And now we've reached the third step, the L for listen. Now, it seems really obvious to all of us, right? We're going to ask and then we're going to listen. It is so hard to listen. I've been working in therapy for over 40 years. I teach people how to listen. And I have to tell you, it's still a daily struggle for me. It's a real struggle for me to listen. Why? Because my brain is always thinking, okay, what am I going to tell her to do? And what good advice do I have for her? And I have to stop that. In order to listen, I have to really listen. And we're going to use the technique called active listening. And what is active listening? Allow them to finish their sentences before you say anything. Don't jump in. Let her finish her sentence. Allow her to finish her thoughts before you jump in. So again, you could say, okay, Debbie, this is easy, easy stuff. I must tell you, over the past two months, my poor husband has complained many times. You didn't even let me finish the sentence, Debbie. And I know it's true because of all the stress of work. I see already how my listening skills at home probably aren't as good as they should be. So let them finish thoughts. Let them finish sentences. Don't interrupt. Encourage them to explain. Could you tell me more? I'd like to understand more. Now, one of the best ways to listen is to use the technique of reflection. Reflect back the content of what they said. Reflect back the feelings that you heard. Now, reflection doesn't mean I'm going to be a parrot. You told me that yesterday you got in the car and you drove to the hospital, and then when you got stopped in the admission room, except I'm not doing that. I'm reflecting back some of what they said or some of what they are feeling so that they can see I'm with them. And this encourages them to talk more. Reflection is an amazing tool because if we reflect, people will talk more. Versus if we ask questions, they often close up. It's okay to ask them if you understood them correctly. How long have you felt this way? Mm -hmm. I care. I'd like to hear more. Tell me more what's going on in your life. I want to help. And a good part of listening is also reassurance. Reassurance that it is a tough situation. Reassurance that it is scary. Often when people want to be listened to, what they're often looking for is validation. That really is so difficult. I don't know how you're getting through this. We have to be very patient as we listen. And it's utterly important that we stay calm. 
when we talk about listening, I think each of us has to maybe do a little self-examination beforehand. Why do we find it so difficult to listen? We find it so easy to ask questions, and we find it so difficult to listen. How many of us already know how we're going to reply before we even ask the question to them? We already know when they finish talking what we're going to say before they've even finished talking. And we have to pull back and really listen. Now, what I invite you to do in this step, as you're doing the just ask five-step process, is maybe think back to a crisis you had. How long, how long did it take before you told someone? Did you tell everything? Did you reach out for help? Or did they ask and reach out to you? Who did you tell? Would you have wanted someone to ask, are you okay? Would you have responded in truth? And the more and more that they did surveys throughout England and throughout Australia, so many people said, I just needed someone to ask. And then I would have talked. Often when I deal with domestic violence victims, they say to me, I don't get it, Debbie. I went to Mikva. Didn't she see the marks? All she had to do was ask and I would have talked. So we're doing our homework and planning. And then, are you okay? And then we listen. And we listen. We're going to listen so we can understand. And I, I really repeat that. I'm not listening so I can tell them what to do. Now, I was a bossy oldest sister. I run an organization. I'm really good at telling people what to do. But that's not listening. We're listening to understand. We're listening without blaming. And that's also hard. Well, what do you think was going to happen if you did A, B, C, D? That's blaming. We're going to take that out. We're just going to listen. And it's hard. It's hard because sometimes we want to blame because then we can go back to believing the world's a safe place if we just don't do what that person did. So we're going to listen to understand. We're going to listen without blaming. And there's one more thing. We're never going to say, I know exactly how you feel, because we don't. Now think about that. We were really taught. We were taught that the best way to be empathetic is to say to someone, oh, I know exactly how you feel. But when someone's in trauma, often that angers them, because you can't possibly know how I feel. You can't possibly understand. You're not sitting in my situation. So don't pretend with me. So we're never going to say, I know exactly how you feel. We're going to listen and we're going to validate. Wow, that sounds really difficult. You have amazing strengths. I don't know how you're handling everything. So the first step was plan, the second step was ask, and the third step was listen. And the fourth step, the E, is encourage. And in this step, we're going to encourage them to make active steps. Now they're feeling overwhelmed. Often they don't know what's the next step. And what we're going to do is tell them, I believe in you. I'm here to help you. Let's sit together and think, is there anything that you can do? Are there little steps that you can take? And don't underestimate the power of baby steps. Baby steps is a fabulous technique. 
And the baby step technique is that I take one little step and then another little step. Now, if I want to get from here to Tel Aviv, I have to take one step and then another step and then another step. Now, maybe eventually I'll get to the bus stop and then get on a bus with another step. But I have to take those first few steps. And that's what we're going to help them do. Now, we might want to help them get professional help, go to a doctor, go to a therapist. And we can really help them here by doing some of the research for them. Maybe I can find out the name of a doctor who specializes in your son's condition. Would you like me to ask around? They're overwhelmed. And if I could take some of these burdens off of them, so that then they could move forward. That's encourage. Offering to help with referrals. Sometimes offering to accompany them. I had a friend who they just recently discovered she has cancer. And for one, before she was admitted for her surgery, she had to come in three days earlier for a whole day of tests. And I offered a driver. Now, I don't live near her. I live in another city, and the hospital's in another city. And she said, I can't come let you drive me. And I said, but that would be my pleasure. Please, let me help you. In other words, accompanying someone so they're not alone is a very big part of this step. Helping them plan. Because one of the things that we learned and we talked about two weeks ago is that when someone's in crisis and trauma, they're so overwhelmed that often they don't have rational thought patterns. And one of the things that I always do in this step is I write it down. If we decide something, either I take a pen and paper and write it and give it to them, or I'll send them a WhatsApp or an email so it's there written for them what we decided. Because sometimes, even in the conversation, when it's over, they blank out. So hand them that piece of paper or send them the WhatsApp of what the two of you decide. Plan, ask, listen, encourage. And the final step is reconnect. R for reconnect. What I'm going to do during this talk is schedule a time to check back in with them. I know you're going to the doctor on Tuesday. How about I call you Wednesday morning to see how it went? Schedule a time to reconnect. If you didn't schedule it, reconnect anyway. Check in with them a few days later. Do you know how many times people said to me, you know, Debbie, I opened up. I really told them everything, and then, boom, they disappeared. I felt used. I felt ichsa. Reconnect is crucial. And that's why we said in the first step, do you have time? But you can't just open up and hear their story and then walk away. Check in with them. A day later, a few days later, then a week later. You're going to check in just to show them that you're still there, that you didn't forget, that you know they're going through a tough time. Now, one of the things that's important in this last step is to remember that if they didn't follow through, if they didn't do what we decided they were going to do, it's understandable. Be compassionate. Understand. It's not that they rejected your advice. It's not that they didn't want to. They couldn't. And we're going to offer emotional support when we check in. Now remember, you can't force someone to get help. You can't force someone to take help. You can't solve their problems, but what you can do is be with them, is walk with them, is listen to them, 
and most important, not abandon them. Now, one of the things we might also do in this final step is try to see if there's some support network that they can lapse onto. Who else can they tell? Who else can give them support? So PAL ER, plan, ask, listen, encourage, reconnect. Just ask. Now, when we talk about the just ask system, we also have to think a little bit about what these people are going through. We live in a society where everybody has to be Superman. Everybody has to be able to cope with everything. And that's really hard for someone who's going through a crisis. On the other hand, if we think about the comic superheroes like Spider-Man, these are all people who in the comic books went through life-changing traumas. But instead of falling apart, they had new strengths as a result of what they went through. In other words, their tragedy, their trauma, awakened in them new strengths and new wisdom. And we, if you look at all the superheroes, Spider-Man and all of these others, it's amazing. Their tragedy allowed them to develop these strengths. Now, you've all heard the saying from Nietzsche, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And what we're talking about is whether you or a friend or a family member is going through a crisis, it's not the end of the story. Today we talk more and more about post-traumatic growth, about the fact that we can all grow from a crisis. We all will face difficulties and difficult events in our lives. Well, sometimes what happened cannot be undone. Our choice is not how to pretend it didn't happen. Our choice is how to move forward and grow from this event. Professor Tadechi and Lawrence Calhoun in the, in the 1990s first began talking about post-traumatic growth how two people can go through the same incident and one of them will grow. And what they learned in their study is that often people are much stronger than they thought. And one quote from their study is, I'm more vulnerable than I thought, but I'm much stronger than I ever imagined. So I think that is really a good depiction of what, of what trauma is. Because trauma is that we suddenly realize how vulnerable we are. But post-traumatic growth is realizing we're also so much stronger than we ever imagined. Now, when we talk about somebody going through a crisis, people can't change the fact that that crisis or trauma happened. Please leave my phone. But 50% of the people who experience a traumatic event will report at least one positive change in their life as a result. And let's compare that to the fact that 15% will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So we all hear about the fact that if there's a trauma, you can get PTSD. But actually, 15% will get PTSD. 50% will be able to say there's something positive that happened as a result. When we face the slings and the arrows of life and we're wounded and we have scars, we can also walk away with a stronger internal resolve. What trauma really does is it shakes up a person's world. It's almost like an earthquake. And we talked about that two weeks ago. The ground underneath them is taken out. And what happens then is their beliefs, and we talked about their assumptions and their beliefs that are shattered. But after these beliefs are shattered, it can allow them to build new, stronger beliefs also. 
Viktor Frankl says, the father of logotherapy says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So in other words, when we're in a situation that we can't change, what we can do is grow and change ourselves. And this gives us something to maybe help us survive this terrible situation. Two people encounter adversity. One will succumb and one may thrive. And really, it's the person who can accept that breakage and then rebuild himself that will get this post-traumatic growth. Now there's, um, I don't know if any of you read Kitchen's Wisdom by um, Naomi Rachel Regan. And she talks a lot about working with patients with um, different types of cancer. And she had one patient who they cut off his legs and he was in a very bad state. And she had him draw a picture and he drew a picture of a vase with a gigantic crack. And he said, that's me now. Years later, he came back to volunteer with patients who went through what he went through. And he was in a remarkable place and he was helping and he was living a good life and he was really post-traumatic growth through and through. And the doctor called him back in to her office and she took out the picture and she said, do you remember this picture? And he took a yellow crayon and he colored on that crack and he said, that's where the light came through. So when everything is shattered and you can't put that vase back together, but maybe you can take each piece of glass and make a mosaic. We have to believe that we can grow from these. We can grow from these traumas. And we have to help the person that we're listening to or who's struggling to believe that as well. Now, Charlotte Delbo, wrote a book, Auschwitz and After, where she talked about a lot of when, what she went through in Auschwitz. And one quote that she said in her book was, I've returned from a world beyond knowledge and now must unlearn, for otherwise I clearly see I can no longer live. In other words, what she said is that I had to relearn how to live and to put that in a different rubric. Now, Viktor Frankl talks a lot about post-traumatic growth, and it's really important to understand there is nothing inherently good about suffering. There is nothing good about the fact that someone went through that terrible situation, but it still doesn't deny the fact that someone could get some good out of that situation. So what we want to do is reach out to people we see are struggling, and then maybe we want to help them find a way to grow through this. Or if it's we who are struggling, find a way that we can grow through it. We're not going to deny their pain. We're not going to die the physical or the psych psychological pain. But what we're going to do is maybe help them or help ourselves recognize that in the midst of this great psych psychological pain, we can also gain a new perspective on how to live. And when they talk to people who had post-traumatic growth, they found that some people found that they changed in the way they looked at life. Some people found that they were more self-aware. Some people found that there were philosophical changes or religious belief changes. And many people felt that they learned to believe that they were stronger than they ever imagined. Um, a few quotes from people who had post-traumatic growth. I discovered I'm stronger than I thought. I know now that I can handle difficulties. I changed my priorities about what is important. So we discussed this evening how to reach out to others who are struggling. We discussed that 
we perhaps can grow and move forward from a trauma. But none of this is easy. It's not easy to reach out to someone who's struggling. And it's not easy if we ourselves are struggling to get to that place that we can grow from this terrible thing that's happened to us. The only thing we can do is believe in our own personal resilience. And maybe one more thing we can do is we can be kinder to one another and kinder to ourselves. And maybe if we can reach out and be kinder to the person next to us and kinder to ourselves, we can really start the process of Tikkun Olam, of making this world a better place. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, that presentation. There are already quite a few questions coming in through the uh, chat group. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, please continue to use the, the chat facility to uh, post them directly to me. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over um, straight over to Mrs. Cohen, to Caroline Cohen. Thank you again, uh, Caroline, for joining us. And um, I'm going to hand over to you, after which we'll open the floor to uh, all the questions. Thank you, Rabbi Zobin, and I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to share a screen with you and hope that my technology will work. Okay. Is there anyone out there? Is anyone listening and can they help me? We know that our community has been phenomenal about hearing those who are calling out for help. Our Rav and Reberton, our trustees and all our lay people. But sometimes people call out for help with a whisper. Sometimes people aren't even able to whisper. And we want to listen to them as Debbie's just spoken about. We want to hear those unspoken words for help. And that's why Rabbi Zobin and Robertson Zobin have spearheaded a project involving a team of professionals. And that project is called Listener. We want to show you at the community of Nair that we are listening to you. We're listening to you because you, like me, we've all experienced challenges this year. COVID has affected all of us. It might be you, it might be a parent, it might be a child of yours, a sibling, a friend, a neighbor, a partner. We want to hear from all of you. Who is Listener? Well, Listener is a team of psychotherapists and psychologists like myself, fully accredited, experienced, working in the Jewish community. And we are going to be led by my colleague, Mr. Shimon Schwab, who works with me at Hana. He's a psychotherapist, and he's been trained at the most respected academic institutions in London. I'd like to share with you a model designed by a lady called Mary Jo Barrett, who lives in Chicago, a Jewish social worker. In fact, I first heard her speak in an event that Debbie organized by at Tahel. Her model is as follows. It's called the collaborative change model. And we're going to use the example of making a cup of tea to understand her model. So what does Mary Jo say? She says, imagine you are ill. In the past, I would say, imagine that you had the flu, but let's, let's imagine you have COVID. And you're lying in bed and you're desperate for a hot drink. So the context is, I'm desperate for a hot drink and I can't get it. I can't even think how to put my leg out of my bed and go and get it. Let alone turn on the tap, pour the water in the kettle, put the tea bag in the cup, put the hot water on it, let the tea bag stew, pull the tea bag out, put the milk in. I can't face that challenge. Let alone imagine the consolidation at the end, which is drinking that cup of tea. So let's apply Mary Jo's collaborative change model to what we're here for tonight. We at the team at Listener want to understand your context. Imagine you're at Spaghetti Junction, the picture on your right. 
and you haven't got a clue which pathway you should take. You're stuck. You're contracted. You're stuck in that space. You're feeling low. It's dark. It's depressing. You've been through some horrors. We at the team at Listener want to understand that. We want to listen to you, as Debbie emphasized. What is the individual challenge that will help you open up that context, help you expand, help you develop? We want to help you find the right pathway. What services are out there for you? So we want to collaborate with you because we know from Mary Jo's research that when someone collaborates with you, as Debbie's just emphasized beautifully, then it's easier to take that next step. On the team at Listener, there are all therapists and psychologists who are aware of the many services out there. And at the end of this session, Rabbi Zobin will post a list to many of those services, a list of many of those services. So we know, and we've crafted this list for you, we know the helplines that are out there. So that if in the middle of the night you need some help, you want someone to talk to, someone to be there with you at that moment, those helplines are listed there. And also websites which you can reach out to and write on those websites. People on the team have worked in the NHS, people like myself. We respect the NHS greatly. But we also know that in these times, the NHS is massively stretched. We will help you first access the NHS, but if they can't be there for you in the way that you need to be there, we will suggest other options. And we in London have the luxury of so many wonderful Jewish social services. And again, members of our team work in those Jewish social services. We have people working in Chai, in Chana, in JWA, JBCS, many of the Jewish social services. To, to access those services will be much easier through our team. So going back to the model, listener is here to be with you in your context, to understand where you're at, and to understand what is going to be your challenge to help you move from that context. And we will want to understand with you what will look like the point of consolidation? What will look like a place where we've done something together, where it's worked for you? So to summarize, we are going to make sense of the service options out there for you by figuring out what you need and we will hold your hands to make those contacts. And this will all be done with a team of professionals, all in the utmost of confidence. When is this gonna start? Well, please God, next Sunday, on our NAIR website, there will be a listener page. And on that page, the whole process will be delineated for you. There'll be FAQs. You'll be able to see a list of the therapists. You will be able to see our beautiful photos and there'll be our bios there and you'll see what our expertise are. And you'll have the opportunity to choose the therapist you want to meet with. And all you'll need to do is send an email to a confidential email address that is just the email address of Lisbon. It's not the main NAIR email address. It's purely a confidential email address for NAIR. You'll be able to book your call or Zoom meeting, and you'll be able to have six meetings in total. So this service, Listener, this project, we, we hope that we will be able to expand this, pro this project to the greater community, the greater Jewish community, and to share it with other faith communities in the wider UK. What's left for me to say is a major thank you to Rabbi and Robertson Zobin for having their vision, for joining with us and the trustees and lay leadership of NAIR and the many volunteers of NAIR to make this work. And to my colleagues at Hana, 
who have helped us by allowing us to use their model, to use their structural systems, to build this structure so quickly to ensure that listener can start next week. And finally, last but not least, thank you all for listening to me. And I would like to hand over now to Rabbi Zogan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline, for that, um, that summary of the uh, new listener project. Um, I, I have to say, I, I sat here um, exceptionally moved. Um, the last screen you shared was one of a, a plant um, sprouting out of the ground. And um, I really feel that my wife and I had the privilege of, of sowing a seed and then seeing how you and uh, your colleague in Khana Shimon and the whole of the Khana team have, uh, have run with this idea, have planted that seed and have produced what, what I really hope will be a, an exceptional um, resource for our community and Emir Hashem um, as we learn and we're able to roll this out to the broader community. Um, I, I think this is, this is absolutely groundbreaking. And uh, our tefillah is that this, um, from this little seed really should grow something um, very big and very positive and something that hopefully can support all of us um, as we navigate our way through that um, complicated uh, spaghetti junction that sometimes uh, life is. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, I, I really look forward to uh, us being able to launch this next Sunday and uh, for the community to, to begin accessing this, uh, this resource. Um, I'm going to folk, um, paste on the uh, chat group the, uh, the document that you and your team prepared, which summarizes uh, some of the resources that are available across the community for now. Um, it's a link to uh, Dropbox and uh, one can get a PDF there of a summary of all the resources. But equally, um, we recognize that very often um, the, the array of resources are confusing and we hope that the listener project will um, will help all of us work our way through these different resources that are available and, and navigate um, our way through difficult times. Um, thank you also again, uh, Debbie Gross, for your presentation. Um, questions have come in thick and fast. And very interestingly, um, th there's a commonality between many of them. So um, perhaps without further ado, I'm just going to begin sharing some of those questions with you. Um, some of those are, are points that you touched upon, and, and I think I'll take those questions in the light of um, a request for further elaboration. Um, so the first question is, and again, this was asked in different forms by, by quite a lot, um, a lot of people uh, in, in, in different forms. W what happens if the person doesn't want to talk? Um, how do we deal with that? Um, what's the balance between um, being pushy and intrusive on the one hand and being helpful on the other hand? How do we know... Uh, when the person who's saying to us they don't want to talk actually are still crying out for help and and there's more that we can uh more that we can do and uh when is it that, that actually this is they're telling us step back leave me alone I, I don't want that help that you're offering okay i i think that's an excellent question and the answer is if they say no it means no if they say everything's fine i don't need any help we hear that they heard that we noticed. They heard that we cared. They heard that we reached out. They might turn to us later on. It also doesn't mean that in another week we can't call up and just say, you know, just check in how you're doing or bring them over a cake for Shabbat or something. like. But we have to respect the fact that they could say no and they could not want to talk. On the other hand, um, if they don't talk to us and it's still very clear to us that they're not in a great place, then we might try to see who else in the community we could talk to that maybe they could reach out to them. So maybe I'm not the right person, but maybe I could speak to the rabbi or Rebbitson and they could reach out to them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, someone else has asked, um, how can one help without being affected? Um, and, and how does one take that step back? You, you spoke about um, perhaps only reaching out to offer support when, when one knows one's in a place where one can self-help. Um, but e even if perhaps one is starting from a position of, of health and well-being, one, one is sometimes affected by, by the support one gives. And um, can you just speak a little bit about how, how one establishes boundaries and how one does take that step back when one needs to and um, how one perhaps support oneself through the process of helping someone else uh, boundaries is the whole key and i can't help somebody if i don't put boundaries in place so in other words i have to really 
know myself how many hours I can devote to this. And the hours that I can't, I have to not answer the phone or I have to say, I can't talk now, I'll call you later. And um, even sometimes if you see that you're really involved with someone who really is pulling all of your energies, it might even be a good idea to speak to a professional to help them figure out with you how to put the boundaries. So it's hard to say generally, how do you put the boundaries? Because each case will be different, but you're not helping them if you're not keeping your boundaries. You're not helping them if you're going to be depleted, because then what's going to happen is you're going to be resentful and they're going to feel it. And then they're just going to be feel more guilty. So it's okay to say, um, look at how about if I call you in three days. It's okay to reach out once a day. You don't have to be on call 24-7. And then the answer would be, um, look at, I'm, I'm very busy at work today, but I know there's a new project called Listener or I know there's this helpline, or maybe it's a good time to contact that therapist that we talked about. In other words, you are not meant to be the professional. You are just a helping to push them on. So that's a good place to say, why don't you call this, or why don't you do this? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I've actually just had a question come in, which um, I'll take. Um, and I should mention, because this, this question has done this, um, you do have the facility on Zoom to change your username. And if, if you want to access me anonymously, um, you can do so and just change your username to one that I won't um, recognize. And someone has done this, that they briefly changed the username to anonymous. Um, and they said, um, thank you, Caroline, for the listener project. Um, I, I need that. Um, please, can you just summarize when that will happen and how I can access it? So maybe I'll, I'll just take that and, and, and give a little summary of that. Um, so this, uh, as Caroline mentioned, we, this will hopefully be up and running next Sunday and the information will be available on our website. But just very briefly, um, the, the listener vision, the listener project will be an online uh, portal, an online uh, booking form or email address, which you'll be able to uh, email. It won't go through the normal May Israel systems and it will allow you to book a phone call or Zoom session with um, one of the therapists on the team and there's a range of therapists on the team. The idea is that unlike a normal helpline, there will be continuity. So you will then have access to that therapist for, um, for several times, up to six sessions. And during that time, they will um, be able to explore in greater depth with you um, what support you need, what is accessible via existing uh, communal organizations and support groups, or whether you need more specialized um, therapeutic support, or it may just be reassurance that actually, um, you know what, you're, you're okay and you're managing okay and the resources you're accessing already are fine. It may be direction to, uh, to other learning resources, or it may be a, a fuller therapeutic um, support. So basically the, the vision of listener, which we hope will be um, accessible from next Sunday, um, will be uh, giving you access to uh, ongoing conversation with a therapist who will be able to talk you through what's going on, hopefully offer some insight and um, then steer you towards uh, support that is available or arrange longer term therapeutic uh, support as the case may be. Um, and uh, thank you for your words of appreciation for that and, and for expressing how needed, um, see how needed that is. Um, now, there are um, several question, further questions here. Um, two of the questions actually use the same words, um, worrying about being patronizing and condescending. Um, one is just about sort of uh, sending a cake. Um, uh, could that be seen as condescending? Um, how can one be sure as one offers that source of support that one's not making things worse? And someone else asked over here, um, you spoke about this, um, the new perspective, the superhero model, um, building resilience, help belief in one's own personal resilience. Um, but they said it can sound so patronizing. You know, I, I'm in a position where I have it so easy, my life's going fine. And then I'm speaking to someone and I'm talking to them about, uh, well, you know, see the good in your dark case of loss and bereavement, appreciate the, um, the, the strengths and, and what you can come out with it from. So how does one actually support someone else getting resilience and being able to draw out the positives in, in what might be a very dark situation without it just sounding a little smug and, and, and patronizing and so doing? Okay, I think that's an excellent question. We're certainly not going to talk about post-traumatic growth in the first conversation with the person. And um, definitely not. In other words, we brought in post-traumatic growth is to really, 
I, I think it's really for each of us when we're going into a crisis, when we're going through something difficult, to remind ourselves that we can grow through it. But when we're reaching out to someone else, first we're going to validate to them how difficult it is. But later, if we continue on with them, then maybe we can help them see some ways that they can grow through it. But certainly not at the beginning. That would be very much rejected. As far as bringing a cake or something like that, if someone says, no, everything's okay, just stopping by with something special, or if they did open up to you, bringing them a cake. I have not had a single person who ever didn't see that is someone just showing that they're continuing to care. I don't think they will see that as condescending. Condescending will be where you say, look at it, it's not so terrible. A lot of people have worse situations. But if you're really empathetic with them, if you're really validating what they're going through, I don't think they're going to think you're condescending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Caroline, I, I don't know if you um, want to add anything to, to a couple of these questions that have been asked. Obviously, you have um, decades of experience yourself, um, both in terms of this most recent question about um, um, supporting people to, to gain resilience, and perhaps a couple of other questions around if people don't want to talk and, and the boundaries around these areas. Um, I'd very much I, like to hear from you also. Yeah, I'd like to add that listener will be there for people if you have a family member that's in need of help and that you don't know how to help them, or a friend, or a neighbor, any of the people that I highlighted before. So if you're feeling that this isn't something that you can manage, you can reach out to us and talk that through with us so that you don't have to manage that on your own. Um, I, I, I think everything else has been covered by, by Debbie. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that really important addition. Um, when I when I summarise this in answer to the question, I, I uh, focus on the person themselves and you but absolutely there to help you support others also. Thank you so much, um, so much for that. Um, someone here has posted a question. Um, beyond, you've spoken a lot about trauma, um, loss, bereavement, resilience. Um, what if it is evident that there are mental health issues involved um, as well as other life issues? How does one convince someone to actually turn to professional help um, where that's uh, where that's relevant? Okay, so when you're reaching out and you're telling them what you see, when we get to step four, encourage, that's where you're going to say, look at, you're really suffering. Maybe making an appointment with a professional could be helpful. Now, usually I don't use the word therapist. Usually we'll say, how about setting up a talk with a professional? And somehow that sounds a little bit less threatening or... Um, doesn't hurt their ego as much, but certainly if they're having mental health issues, one of your encouraging steps is going to be how do you move them to professional help. But maybe you can't even say that in the first conversation. Maybe in the first conversation you just have to be with them, and in the second or third, it really depends on how the conversation goes. And then you could call the listener to to really figure out where can you refer them to so that when you come back to them, you actually have names for them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of people have posted in the chat group um, additional ideas and organizations that we probably should have or could have added to our list. Um, I'm not going to read them out now aloud because um, I've learned from experience that um, any quick and spontaneous reaction uh, is often an error. Um, but those people have posted me with ideas. I, I am uh, cutting and pasting them and we'll note them. And we will reissue our list of um, communal uh, resources to turn to. Um, I've, I've seen already through this uh, chat comments here now that it wasn't an exhaustive list. Um, it was compiled by a few of us and it may well be their organizations, important and really valuable organizations that we missed up. Or there may have been particular reasons why they were missed off. So I don't want to act um, without consulting with the team. Um, but thank you so much uh, to those of you who have posted these um, these other organizations, and I will note them. And uh, I, I guess our uh, our list of uh, resources to turn to, um, there, there's so much more good stuff going on in, the, in our community. So we will update that list and use our website um, to share further um, resources. Um, we are first running out of uh, time, um, but maybe I can just ask one more uh, question of you, which has been asked here in the group, um, which is... Well, if someone opens up to one spontaneously, a way one hasn't had time to prepare, um, do you have advice around that? Is, is it better actually to say, 
Thank you for opening up. Let me take a deep breath, think about this and get back to you. Rather than reacting spontaneously, or does one take advantage of that opportunity? How come on any ideas about sort of thinking on one's feet when one has that um, conversation that really might be a, a very brave conversation that the person has decided to speak? Mm -hmm. And uh, making sure that one responds appropriately. Okay, so when we talked about the plan step, we even said that if you're in a situation where you see somebody having a mental health issue in the small supermarket that you're standing there, you're obviously not going to go home and start writing things down. You're going to interact then. And if somebody approaches you, so basically you're going to skip the first step and go on with the other steps. And so if they start talking, then you're going to use your listening skills and you're going to show your empathy. And you're also going to try to listen to what they're saying so that you know you can really understand what's going on so again you're going to listen to understand and then you're going to encourage them in any way to get the help they need so um the only thing you're doing is skipping the first step but the question might be if someone opens up to you and this isn't the right time for you so it's it's okay to listen you're not going to stop them it's okay to listen and validate and then really think who else they can tell with them. And you can say, look, at, I would love to keep meeting with you, but as you know, um, my daughter's getting married this week and everything's hectic. Let's think who else could be of help for you right now. So you're, even if you're too busy now, listening, giving them empathy, and then using that talk to think, how can we move them on to someone else could be beneficial? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, one final question I've been asked, and, and perhaps I'll just briefly address this, is um, is this a going to be, is listener going to be a free service? So again, more information will be available on the website. Um, the model we have adopted is that the initial contact and um, first session will be free, so that everyone can access it. And there are obviously costs involved in running this, um, and follow-up sessions, we, we will ask people if they can do so. Um, to help us cover the costs, but equally no one will be turned away um, due to finance. So um, everyone should feel absolutely able to access it, um, and the initial contact will, will be at no cost to allow people to access it, um, but if one's able to do so, obviously the, the, the project as a whole is, is, is one that um, uh, has costs, and, and obviously we thank uh, our generous supporters for enabling this to take place, but would ask people if they are in a position to do so too. Uh, contribute towards the costs of, of the projects if they're using it. Um, we have run out of our allocated time, um, and I am conscious again as I began um, that for Debbie it is two hours later. Um, it is 11 p.m. In, uh, um, in, uh, in Israel. So thank you so much for um, three weeks in a row of absolutely phenomenal sessions. Um, I, I've had the, uh, I and my wife have had the privilege, privilege and pleasure really of sitting in on, on all three and learning so much from you. Um, so thank you for, for those sessions, and we look forward to a, a continued communal relationship um, with you. And thank you, Caroline, for your presentation this evening. Um, but the presentation really is the tip of, an iceberg, of the iceberg of, of weeks of, of exceptional work and effort and vision put into um, building the Listener Project. And uh, we are sure that this will be uh, uh, an exceptional resource um, for our community and to meet Hashem in the long run for the broader, wider community also. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, the summary of it. And uh, to everyone here on this uh, meeting, um, thank you for joining us this, this evening. Please spread the word about the Listener Project. Um, and let's hope we can all help and support each other using some of the insight and uh, vision and wisdom that we've, uh, we've achieved this evening. Thank you so much again. And uh, to everyone, have a good evening.